Now, this is a very important topic is to how to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Now, what we are sharing is not comprehensive because um, there will be many other verses that we may have inevitably missed out. But it's only a teaser to stir up your interest to go and search scripture so that uh, you will be even better equipped. But the important message is to be ready. So with that short introduction, let's move on to the little slides. All right. So here in Revelation 19.7, which is one of our favorite books in the Bible, let me read. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So the question here is that, first of all, are you ready? And secondly, how do we prepare ourselves while we still have breath on this, in, on this earth? How do we make sure that we are ready where the last trumpet sound will be caught up in the air and we will enjoy the presence of our Lord Yeshua in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So with that, let's start with the various slides that we have prepared for you. This is a warning. Be ready, for much is given. Indeed, much will be required. So here in Luke 12, 40, he said, therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So here, while we may always be thinking of the time and the hour that Yeshua will return, it is a search in futility. We will never be able to do that, but we do know the season. He came, first of all, as a Passover lamb, and then he resurrected as a first fruit. And then he sent his Holy Spirit in Pentecost. And therefore, we know that the Feast of the Lord is an appointment that God has given to us to show us of his first coming as a sacrificial lamb of God and also show us in the last remaining three feasts, the feast in the fall, which is the feast of um, trumpet, the feast of atonement, and the feast of tabernacles that we will be joining with the conference this year, that these three feasts will signify his second return as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord. So we know the season. We know that he will return as he had first come during the feast and he will return again during the feast. So we know the season, but we do not know the hour. <laughs> we do not know the day. Neither do we know the year. So in that sense, the most important thing we need to do is to be always be prepared. Like the scout motto, you know, <laughs> be prepared. <laughs> be prepared in all time, in all season. Now reading from Luke 12, verse 47 to 48. And the servant who knew his master will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. So the question is that if you have been told, you know, on the time of his coming, on the season of his coming, rather, and you are not prepared, and you do not believe it, even though you know it, you will suffer great loss. But here, this servant will be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed the things deserving of the stripes, shall be beaten with few. So now, the warning to every one of us, as we teach and share the second coming of the Lord Yeshua, you know the master's will. And if you do not act to become prepared, there will be great loss on your part. Not only great loss, but there may be even great suffering that entails because of your lack of attention. So the warning is, be prepared. Like the scout motto, be prepared. So reading on, for everyone who much is given, from him, much will be required. So whatever the Lord has given to you, basically the talents he has given to you, the creativity, 
uh, the various giftings that he's given to you. The more you have, the more that is required from you to multiply them and be fruitful. So to whom much has been committed of him, they were asked for more. So again, much is given, much is required. So in summary, it is a very serious warning, not just to be prepared, but be ready. For we know the season of his return. We know from scripture very clearly that he will return back. It's not, not if, it is when he returns. So here, again, I want to emphasize this great and very urgent warning to every one of us. Be prepared while there is still light. Work while there is still day. Amen. Amen. And moving on, uh, therefore, watch. In, um, Luke, in Matthew 25, verse 13, it says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So this is again an emphasis of what uh, we have shared earlier. And uh, reading from uh, Luke 21, 34 to 36, but take heed to yourself, lest your heart be weighed down by carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come to you unexpectedly. Now here, many of us are weighed down, weighed down by the cares of the world, weighed down because of our drunkenness. Drunkenness is a way that uh, people just drink to, to really, um, you know, ease their pain, I would say, all right, to, to get themselves in stupor so that uh, they will not be, you know, uh, remembering the pain that they have, but yet they miss out a lot of opportunities, right? So here, do not be in a state of stupor or drunkenness. Uh, do not really, you know, doing things which are not pleasing to the Lord and do not let the cares of this world be burdening you such that it takes your focus away from the Lord. For the day of coming will be unexpectedly. So verse 35, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Here we mentioned a snare. A snare is actually a trap, a trap, right? It's a trap that, uh, you know, we as hunters, right? We put a snare or a trap to... Uh, and put some food in it to entice the animals or the birds to come in and then pop, very quickly, the, the trap is uh, uh, activated. activated and then you are caught suddenly, you know, you are caught. So here, uh, do not get into yourself in this situation where you are entrapped by the cares of the world. Right. So therefore, verse 36 says, watch therefore and pray always. So when you watch therefore, you always come with a prayer. All right. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. Now I want to unpack this word, worthy to escape all these things that will surely come to pass. What are all these things? We know that reading from the book of Revelation, there will be a time which is known as the Great Tribulation. There are some sector of uh, the teaching that the believers will be caught up and escape the tribulation. All right, But I think that is a very complacent type of teaching that uh, basically uh, you know, give you uh, the comfort that you don't need to do anything because when the tribulation comes, before that, you already escaped it. I don't think that will happen. I think all of us will go through that. But when we say be counted worthy to escape all these things, means that you will be kept safe. Safe from this uh, tribulation that comes. All right. And then you'll be caught up and stand before the Son of Man. So here it is uh, leading to the... Uh, harvest of the bride that we are all would like to be, or those who are dead in Christ, that uh, the bride was still uh, caught alive, they will be kept safe so that they will escape the great tribulation that surely will come. So here to be alert and not be deceived by the world, not to be weighed down by the cares of this life, and you have or we have to seek 
the Holy Spirit for his wisdom. For there is no wisdom higher than the wisdom from the Lord. So here I want to encourage every one of us that to seek wisdom, to ask the Holy Spirit to show us how best we can protect ourselves, how best we can prepare ourselves to be the bright and radiant bride of Yeshua. So all of this watchfulness comes real prayer and the power that comes through the knowledge and the guidance by the Holy Spirit. So here, this is very timely uh, warning that the time and the hour is coming very soon that we will begin to see even much more evil that comes onto the world. And henceforth, the instruction here is to watch and to pray and to always, like what Prophet Robert Mawari said, always be wise and seek the Lord and his spirit for guidance. So here, watch and pray. Uh, keep awake and be alert, watching and perceiving what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. So the best way is to welcome the Holy Spirit, that what we have just done, into your home, into your office, into your family. Get to know the Holy Spirit. And it's a matter of being acquainted with him to seek after him. And whatever situation and circumstances that you may be in now, ask the Holy Spirit for guidance. Seek the word. And as you read the word, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what you ought to do. And I think we need to practice that while we have still breath in our body and our spirit and to get so close and so alert with the Holy Spirit that he speaks to us. And we have heard many stories of people who hear from the Holy Spirit and avoided danger because at the last minute, the voice speak to the person, move away. And as soon as you move out of that place, the bomb just exploded. Right. So here, it is so important for us to have this sensitivity to the Spirit of God. And then here, watching the unfolding of His purpose for your life. We ask ourselves, why are we here? Why are we put in this situation? What has that to do with our career? So we have to ask the Lord, what is His purpose and His mental or His calling for your life and my life? And He will show you because as you seek Him, He will reveal to you either from the Word or through circumstances or through you know, the um, association with like-minded people uh, that will speak into your life. And so we need to be watchful, all right, and to know his purpose for your life. And it is very important to be aware of what's happening at, in our surrounding. Uh, watch the development in this world, particularly what is happening in the Middle East and in Israel. And now we have this uh, crisis in Ukraine. What is the Holy Spirit speaking to us in relation to what is happening? So do not be a hermit, you know, that. Uh, you shut yourself out from world news and <laughs> seek recruits in a cave. <laughs> that is not what the Lord wants you and I to do. The Lord wants us to be aware of what is uh, happening in our nation, what is happening in our neighborhood, what is happening in the world, particularly in the Middle East and in Israel. So that when we are watchful and when we pray and we seek the Lord, the Lord will show you what is to come. And I must say, this is an individual thing that we need to practice. Uh, you cannot uh, subcontract it out to your spouse or subcontract it out to your pastors. It's a personal relationship that you and I need to develop with the Holy Spirit. So watching the strategy of the enemies, what is he doing? You know, it is very clear that the sinful nature of what the enemies uh, are doing in our life is very clear recorded in the Bible what constitutes sins. And so you watch the strategy of what the enemy is doing to your family, to your loved ones, 
And then because knowing it, you know how to pray a hedge of protection and also how to pray uh, to cast out those uh, demonic uh, attacks into your home and to your family and also to your nation. So watching our own heart is also very important, all right, because it is out of your heart what comes forth, you know, the, the, the focus of your the life, issues. Uh, the issues of life. Thank you, Dan. All right, so let's move on quickly uh, to um, how to be ready. When I was seeking the Lord to prepare for this session, you know, every time the Lord speaks to me when I'm just about to wake up and I'm still in this twilight zone, you know, uh, I will just linger on and I will ask the Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? Uh, how, what is the special uh, message that you have for your people during the Shabbat service? And the Lord spoke to me very clearly. Teach them and show them through the Lord's prayer. Now, this is the way that uh, the disciple asked Yeshua, how do we pray? And I believe that there is a lot of important unlocking of the keys from the Lord's prayer. And let's recite this together and then I will unpack it for you. So in a count of three, one, two, and three. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallow be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And everyone says, Amen. So here, let me unpack it for you. It shows that we have a father. And because he is in heaven and he is our father, our relationship to the father is that we are his sons and daughters. So as I shared just now during the baptism class, I say it's so important for us to know who we are in relation to our father in heaven. We are so precious to him. We are his sons. We are his daughters. We are co-heir with our Lord Yeshua. And that put us into a very high position of great esteem from the sight of our father. So do not let anybody telling you that you are useless. Do not anyone telling you that you are uh, not successful. Because when you seek after the father, he says, you are my son. You are my daughter whom I Love. So our identity in this prayer is our Father who art in heaven. He is in heaven. All right. So here it is so important for us to understand our identity just from the first verse. And hello be your name. His name is to be consecrated. He is a holy God. He is a God of great holiness that we have to acknowledge that because he's holy. And to see him, we ourselves need to be sanctified. We ourselves need to be cleansed. We ourselves need to be also holy. So one way to prepare ourselves to be the loving bride of Yeshua is to seek after the sanctification by the renewing of a mind through the reading and the studying of the word of God. So hello be your name and your kingdom come. There is a kingdom and the kingdom has a king and a domain and the king is our Lord Yeshua. And when Yeshua comes to earth, not just only for salvation, not just only to shed his precious blood to redeem us unto his father, not only that, but his other main intention is to establish the kingdom of God. So when he meet up with our father, and he will hand the kingdom of God to his father, right? He will hand his kingdom to the Father as is this mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Yeah, that Jesus will hand the kingdom of God to God the Father. So this is his great mandate from the Father who tells him to come and die for our sin, but also importantly, 
to establish his kingdom so that when our father comes in, our Lord Yeshua will hand his kingdom to our father. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. And then here he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So yeah, in heaven, there is no sickness. In heaven, there is no grief. In heaven, there is uh, full of joy. In heaven, there is uh, no sin. So what Yeshua is teaching us is to speak it out that whatever that is in heaven where there is joy, where there is love, where there is no sicknesses, be as it is on earth. So here we are also taught in many other uh, sessions by other preachers that we can actually appropriate healing by even asking and commanding you know, our organs that is so pristinely kept in heaven to be downloaded as a heart transplant, for example. We can have an organ transplant. And uh, it has been done before by miracles that whatever that is in heaven, we can appropriate it because according to our desire of our heart in this Lord's prayer is thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God's will is that all of us shall prosper. All of us should have healthy body. All of us should have the mind of Christ. So here, moving on to verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. So we don't have to be concerned because manna is coming from heaven. And especially when there is a great uh, tribulation, food will be scarce or everything will be disruptive. But yet we know as we worship him, miracles will happen in our midst. Just like he sent the raven you know, to feed Elijah. All right. In the same way, there will be miracle, there will be multiplication of food and we will not be of any lack. So this is how we pray. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. So the importance of forgiveness is so important. If we do not forgive people, you know, our anger, our unforgiveness will come and to torment us. And our spirit and soul will have no peace. As a result of this tormentation by our remembrance of what the people have done unjustly to us. We will be so tormented. So the Father tell us, forgive them as I have forgiven you. So this power of forgiveness is immense. It's not just only for those who have harmed us, but it's mainly for our own blessing. That if we forgive others, the torment of the devil will be released and he has no hold on our life. And we can live life joyfully. So now I want to declare and I decree, if any one of you hearing us this session, the Shabbat service, that you have unforgiveness and even though it is unjustly done to you, you are justly right, you know, that uh, you know, those people are being unkind to you in words or in deeds, yet when you forgive them as a father has forgiven us, there is great power. You release it and your Will be, and your body will be blessed. Your immune system will be up and coming and every pestilence, every viruses in your body will be dispelled by the natural immune, immune system that will be strengthened because you have released the unforgiveness and you have forgiven those that have unrighteously uh, caused hurt to you. And so here, do not lead us into temptation. Now this actually thing that, oh, God tempt us, no, God forbid, God doesn't tempt us. According to James chapter 1, verse 13, uh, James basically recorded that God does not tempt us. It is only the evil one, Satan, tempt us. So here, uh, this is to be read that he doesn't tempt us, but he will deliver us from the evil one because God cannot tempt us. He's a God who loves us. Or right? it's the evil one that tempts us. And therefore, the last verse is that to declare it. Your kingdom comes, all right? For yours is the kingdom. And soon, Yeshua will come and hand the kingdom of God that he has appropriated to Father God. And there is power and there's glory that comes when the kingdom comes. But right? in us now and even when it comes 
during the millennial period. So here, the Holy Spirit speaks to me that how to be ready. We appropriate this Lord's Prayer is one of the keys to be ready to be the bride of Yeshua. And moving forward, we notice that there are seven blessedness in the book of Revelation. Now, when the bride meets up with Yeshua, he says, you are blessed. So here, there is much things that we can learn from these seven blessedness that is mentioned in the book of Revelation and how we can actually learn how to appropriate the blessings. Because to be the bride, you are the blessed one. So here in Revelation 1.3, he says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for what? The time is near. So here, in order to be prepared and ready to be the bride and to be blessed, you read his word, particularly the prophecies that is mentioned in the book of Revelation. And moving on to Revelation 14, 13, the second blessedness is, then I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead and who died in the Lord from now on. Yes, say the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Now, this is with reference to those who are dead, all right, uh, before the return of Yeshua. And also make reference to those during the great tribulation that they will be the martyrs. All right, they will be the martyrs. And uh, as a result of the martyrdom, uh, they will also similarly be harvested at the same twinkling of an eye together with those who are still alive. Uh, moving on to the third lesson, this is Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and see his shame. So here again, to be prepared to be the bride, we have to be watchful. As I mentioned earlier, we have to be watchful and also what we see, we are commanded to pray into its existence, to bring out things that are in the invisible realm to be visible on earth. All right, so here, the three lessons, and let's move on quickly to the fourth, uh, which is in Revelation 19, 9. Then he said, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true saying of God. So this is, I mentioned to you, that the bride of Christ and those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb are blessed. And so our desire is to be the bride. Our desire is to be prepared. And our preparedness comes from knowing the scripture and some of these uh, verses that I'll be sharing with you in this uh, series of teaching. So here, Revelation 26 says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but there shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So here, I just declare that all of us will be blessed, that we will take part in the first resurrection to be caught up be caught up as the first fruits, among the first fruits, as the bride of Yeshua. Revelation 22, 7, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. Now, what is important in this uh, blessedness is to be ready to know that Yeshua is coming back quickly. It's not if, but when. And he's coming back quickly. Now, quickly seems to be when this was written, it's now almost two, more than 2,000 years. All right. And so therefore, we need to know that uh, we have to be prepared all the time. Uh, he can come back tomorrow. He can come back, uh, you know, a month later, a year later, or a few more uh, decades from now. But he will certainly return. The last blessedness is Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. Again here, this is what the wisest man uh, in scripture, King Solomon, he says, keep his commandments. I fear the Lord and keep his commandments. So I just want to encourage every one of you, including myself, and we declare and we proclaim that all of us will have the desire and the empowerment by the Spirit of God that we are able and faithful to the death even to by keeping His commandments. Hallelujah. And here, 
Correspondingly, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, if you look clearly, carefully with the Sermon on the Mount, I discovered that altogether there are nine of them, but seven of them are what we can do, the inward part. And two of them is what other people do to us, you know, that they can persecute you, you know, they will, uh, you know, throw all kinds of accusation against you. Those are the external ones. But there are seven of those uh, blessedness that will help us to be prepared to be the price or as the pride, as the bride of Christ. So what are these? The first one, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit doesn't mean that you are financially poor, but you are so hungry for the righteousness that comes from the spirit, that you seek after the spirit. That's why you are poor in that sense, but in the good sense. Right? When I first read this, I say poor in spirit means that you've got no spirit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that. That you are you recognize your your lack of it, or you are so desirous to even be more that uh, even what you have, you still recognize that you do not have enough of the spirit. That's why you deem yourself to be poor in the spirit. All right, the next blessedness is that um, those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, this is a great teaching of Yeshua. Meek doesn't mean that you are the doormat to be rolled over, you know, trampled upon by people. Meek means that you know you're right. You know that you're anointing. You know that you're son of God. But when people come and derail you, you can be gentle. right? Because you have an inner strength that you do not need the uh, uh, adoration of people. But you clamor for the adoration of our Father in heaven. So Moses says he's the meekest of all. <laughs> so in that sense, uh, you know, uh, well, we have to take it in that way that uh, he's the meekest man. Yeah. So here, the next one is, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Right? Now, despite the fact that we may go through trials, that we may find that ourselves is being beaten down, but the Holy Spirit is always there. The Holy Spirit is always there to comfort you. All right, so here, moving on quickly. Uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So one way to prepare ourselves to be the bride of Yeshua is to hunger and thirst by doing what the words say to be right with God. So I just want to declare that all of us, hearing all this uh, various messaging from Yeshua, as the Sermon on the Mount, that we learn how to uh, take this into our spirit and to practice them. And that is a sure way to prepare ourselves for what is to come. And then here, blessed are the merciful, for that we show mercy. So here God says, you know, be merciful. You know, whatever thing you do, always content to be merciful, for that is the spirit of the Lord. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the Son of God. You make peace, make peace with those who have hurt you. My only way of making peace with those people that have hurt you is to have first forgiveness. <laughs> so they tie back together the importance of forgiveness, and then you will become at peace with yourself, and you turn to be a peacemaker. So here, moving forward in this chapter 24, and also Matthew chapter 24, and chapter 24. Yeshua gave us three parables. Right? Three parables that actually uh, point towards the direction of how do we prepare ourselves to be the bride of Christ. All right, these three parables have the same plot. Right? And the main character in these three parables is uh, the master, which uh, actually uh, sy- uh, symbolizes Yeshua himself. Uh, the master is expected to return, all right, but no time specified. <laughs> so the return of Yeshua is definite, but there is no specific time because he needs to hear from the Father God that this is the time that you can go and fetch the bride. So this master or Yeshua is expected to return, but the time is not specified. Uh, we need to be watchful. All right, many of them have fallen asleep. So the, 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 the messaging here is to be watchful and we need to ask God for his wisdom. So here the character is uh, the master uh, of the household, which is in Matthew 24, 45. 
uh, the master here is depicted as the bridegroom of the wedding. And you have the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. And then here we have the parable of the talents. All right, those who invest them and make uh, the same amount of talents that you have, the, the, the master had given. The master here, the investor, which is uh, Yeshua himself. And so here we have these three wonderful uh, parables that Yeshua repeatedly mentioned that in uh, uh, one swing in terms of uh, chapter 25 and 20, 24, because the Bible is actually written with no chapters. So it's actually in one uh, continuous flow of his teaching. And uh, it talks about the same thing. All right. He talks about he will be away. He will be away for a long, long time. And no one will know that he will return, but he will return. And we need to be watchful and we will need to seek the wisdom of God so that we can be prepared when he returns that we will find us not lacking. So here, going into uh, in greater detail uh, on the uh, first parable that uh, the master asked the servant to feed his household with food. So in this case here, it is equivalent to us that... Uh, the household or the house of God is given to us either with a representation of a family or the representation of a marketplace, a workplace, or even uh, the church itself or the nations that we who have been taught the word of God, we have a responsibility to go and to feed others with the same spiritual food that we have received. So much is given much is expected. So those of you who have been consistently uh, attending the Shabbat service and have been blessed by the teachings of uh, my wife and I and also by Prophet Robert Mawari, it is your responsibility to take this spiritual food and to go and to share with others. So much is given, much is expected. All right, so here, this is pointed uh, in this parable that this wise servant began to feed his uh, servants, other servants with a physical food, but in this context, we have to share the word of God to those that uh, we come into our midst. And then the parable of the foolish virgin and the wise virgin is not so much about oil, or because all of them are believers. They have the oil, but the important things is on the word reserve of the oil. The wise one has enough reserves. So when the bridegroom comes, you know, <laughs> they have enough oil to keep the lamp lit up. Right? So the unwise one do not have reserve. And I want to mention to you, the reserve cannot be purchased at the last minute. In which case, the foolish virgin wanted to purchase it because they don't have enough. But yet, when they go out in panic to purchase the oil, when they return, the door is shut. So here the understanding of this parable is that we need to continually build up our reserve on a daily basis and it cannot be done at the last minute where there is tribulation, where there is panic. It's too late. So I want to again declare and proclaim that all of us will be wise, like we will be like the wise virgin that we will continue to seek after the Holy Spirit, that we will continue to read the word and to continue to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit such that our reserve, our relationship with the Spirit of God is being built up every day of our life. In the sensitive years of hearing, that we will be able to hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to us. So here, this trading, the, the, the third uh, parable, of the talents that was given to us. Now, the word traded uh, in Matthew 25, 16, in the, you know, the, uh, the uh, concordance, uh, 2038, is called agamzaimai, agazomai, uh, <laughs> meaning a work that is accomplished, all right? What is given to you in terms of talents. So the important messaging from this parable is that whatever talent that the Lord has given to you, the gift of the Spirit of God that has given to you, the talents that has given to you, let it not go to waste. Let you build up those talents. Let it be uh, fruitful and uh, you know, multiply it 
so that when the Lord comes or return, we can tell them how fruitful we have been with the talents that he has given to us. So do not be envious of those who are having more talents than you have, because much is more is given and more is required. But you are given less, you are also required less in terms of your contribution. So here, the important thing is not how many talents that you are given, but what do you do with the talents that have been given to you? All right, so here, there is a great important things to learn from these three parables. And these three parables point out to us how do we be prepared all right, in the days of his coming. So here, the key message is that uh, what you do must be so ingrained in us that it becomes second nature. And that is come with practicing it on a daily basis, not out of panic. Because as I mentioned earlier, when persecution comes, there is no time to prepare. So here we have to be motivated uh, by the fact of Yeshua's return, not by his timing. So some of us think that, oh, when he's coming back tomorrow, then I quickly go and read the word of God. Now that will not uh, hold water for you. It is not so much about the timing of his return. So do not really run after you know, this uh, understanding of when it's to come. But it is more so that we are motivated by the fact, and this is the truth, that Yeshua is returning and he is coming back to reward us. And this is the type of uh, focus that will keep us going along this journey of uh, getting ourselves sanctified getting ourselves to be prepared because we know as a fact that he is returning back and he is a rewarder of those who are faithful and we are looking forward to the rewards that is going to turn out to us. Pardon me? Diligently seeking. Yes. My wife added on, diligently seeking after him. All right. So here, again, uh, the Lord is looking for those who are faithful. All right. The Lord requires faithfulness. And as I mentioned earlier, fruitfulness also. So not only just be faithful that you are with your talents. All right. You keep your talent like the foolish one, buried under the ground. And the Lord said, you are a wicked servant. But you need to be fruitful in what the Lord has given to you. And so you may ask me, what did the Lord give to you? the only Holy Spirit will reveal to you. So ask the Holy Spirit, what is the thing that you like most to do in your life and that you get pleasure by doing it? And that will be the gift that he has given to you. And then seek after the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit, how could you best have it multiplied and be fruitful? All right? And that is only the way you can answer that for yourself. So, not the way that we approach success as the world look at us. All right, the world measures success as the position you hold, how much um, or how many dollar signs you have in your bank account. All right, that's how the world look at you. The position that you hold, the influence that you may have in the natural realm, but the success in the eyes of our Father is how much have you done for His kingdom? How many lives have you sold into? that you'll make them uh, more in love with Yeshua. So these are the way God measures us in relation to our success, not the way that the world measures us. So when we go to heaven, we'll be in for a surprise. Many people will think they're very successful. <laughs> They'll be given very, very small houses. <laughs> for those like the old lady that will be praying constantly, right? They'll be having mansion or because she is constantly alert and watchful and praying uh, that he, she has done great exploit in the kingdom. Yeah. All right, so here, how to keep our position as a bride of Christ. We have talked about how do we prepare. So the important thing now is to, how do we, after we prepare, maintain that position? that we have achieved is first of all, we must come to our Father with gratefulness in our heart. We must be obedient to his will. Uh, we're going to touch on the individual faith. The faith is, uh, cannot be uh, by inheritance. Uh, we are continuously having to seek after him. We need to have personal holiness and we also have communal fellowship. So let me unpack for you on all these uh, six uh, positions, and I'm sure that there are more of it, 
But these are the six ones that we just want to highlight during this session. All right, here, gratefulness to Abba Father. So here, uh, the book of Jonah, chapter 4, verse 6, let me read to you. And the Lord prepared a plant and made it come over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was grateful for the plant. <laughs> So here, this is the story of Jonah. He went down to uh, curse uh, Nimanif and uh, the Father God actually, uh, you know, did not bring destruction because the people in the nation repented and Jonah was angry with God. <laughs> so he ran away and then uh, there was a plant that came and provided him with shade and he was grateful for what the plant has done for him. So in the same way, we need to approach our Father with that gratefulness of what he has given to us the blessing that has given to us. And so here in Philippians 1, 3, he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. So there are many ways that we could think of being grateful to our Father. And we worship him, we thank him. We thank him for good health. We thank him for restoration. And most of all, we thank him for the, for the precious blood of his son that shed on the in Calvary that we are redeemed back to our Father. So here, in terms of, uh, you know, um, joy, when I Google, uh, uh, when I search on the Bible app on the word joy, it came out 192 times. All right. In Old Testament, it's 127 times. In New Testament, it's 65 times. And uh, one of the verses I pick up is Nehemiah 8.10. Uh, let me read. Then he said to them, go your way, eat fat, drink a sweet, send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, this is uh, my favorite verse. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's why it's always very important for us to have gratefulness, thankfulness, and to have the joy of the Lord. Because this joy is bubbling from inside out. Happiness is what you see, you know, it's transient. Uh, you may get a bonus and then you are happy for that moment. Right? You may be given an award uh, by your company and you are happy for that moment. But that moment flees. It's very fleeting. It, it disappears very quickly. But the joy of the Lord is internal flowing out from your very spirit and soul. And it will give you strength. And the joyfulness of the Lord can come only with a thankful heart, with a grateful heart. Okay. Actually, the most important thing we need to be grateful to God is how do we, how did he seek and find us? Because the Bible told us that in Roman talk about all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it is very important to reflect on how we came to know the Lord. And actually, a lot of us thought that we came to the Lord because we look for him. Actually, he's the one <laughs> that came to look for us. Mm -hmm. We were lost, but he's the one that looked for us. So he made us think that we found him. But actually, he was the one that come and search out for us. So the Bible said, while we were yet sin, uh, he sent his son Jesus to die for us. And we have just gone through the yearly Passover. Um, one of the reasons when I reflect about the Jewish people after 1,900 over years of having no country, no nations of their own. And yet, a lot of the Jewish people, they still uh, observe the Shabbat. They still observe the Torah and the Old Testament. It is because every year they celebrate Passover. And when they celebrate Passover, the father will recite the story of how God, mm. how God uh, led them 
delivered them out of the bondage of Israel. They were slave in, uh, not Israel, in Egypt. They were slave in Egypt. And how God sent Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. So when they and tell the story and have the Shabbat meal, every year they are reminded. So the children in the family, every year they will be told the same story. And the children also are given the opportunity to look for the masak that is uh, broken and put in the middle of the three pockets. So as I reflect more and more, I realize the importance of the parents needs to tell the children how they come to know Jesus. Because all of us have seen and fall short of the glory of God. No matter how good you are in the eyes of human beings, we have all fought short of the glory of Amen. God. So, because the Isaiah also talked about all our righteousness are filthy rags. So to God's holiness, no matter how good you are, we always fall short and no one can save our own self. So only God became man and died on the cross for us that he is able to use his precious blood to redeem us and we became reconciled with God and then we can enter into God's family. So the more you reflect on it, the, the more grateful you become. Then the thankfulness will come from your heart. Hmm. And because you are thankful uh, and then you realize how much God loves us, that before the foundation of the earth, he already chosen us. And Jesus already planned to come as human because he is Jesus, uh, God is omniscient. He knows everything and he planned the end from the beginning. So Isaiah also 4610 also talked about this. So Jesus, before the foundation of the earth, already planned to come to walk, being re, uh, incarnate and becomes a son of man. So he is both son of God and son of man. And because of him, we are able to reconcile with God and uh, we can enjoy the Holy Spirit that now lives in us. And every one of us who are born again are given the gift of the Father, which is the spirit of truth, and we know him as the Holy Spirit. And, and in John 15, it talks about when we love God and obey his commandment, the Holy Spirit come and live in us, and even Jesus and Father God come and live in us. Amen. So it's the triune God that will dwell in us. So it is different from the Old Testament time. This time, the Holy Spirit is indwelled in us. That's why Psalm 91 is important. But Psalm 91 is Old Testament also. We need to uh, dwell in the secret place of the Most High. But when it comes to New Testament, Jesus said you need to, I'm the true vine, and you need to abide in me. So without me, you can do nothing. You cannot bear fruits. You cannot, you cannot be of any value in the kingdom of God. So uh, we need to know that we are so blessed and privileged that we have the Holy Spirit that comes Amen. and lives in us. Whereas Old Testament, only the prophet and the Holy Spirit will come upon them and then they will just prophesy and uh, someone will write it down. But they sometimes do not understand what they say. But it's, it's now that we have the the Bible, then we can we have all the all the six books. So we're super blessed that we are living in this time of the history that we, we can know the whole counsel of God. Amen. Yeah. 
Well, in fact, uh, next Shabbat, uh, Pastor VC and Sabrina will be taking us through and uh, John 15. That's what uh, Actually, Christina John, has shared. Yeah, John is such an important book because John shows that uh, shows the divinity of uh, Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And uh, for preparation of next week, actually, today I just uh, went through the, the Gospel of John again, actually starting from 12. You should read all the way to uh, 18 to, to see the whole flow. And uh, these are very important chapters. 15, uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17 is super important. Amen. All right, let's move on quickly. Um, and then the next one we talk about is uh, to be obedient to God's will. And it's so important because in 1 Samuel 15, 22, uh, when the, you know, King Saul came and could not wait, uh, and he went and made sacrifice himself, which he's not supposed to do, and this is what the Lord say, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. All right. So because of the disobedience of King Saul, his kingdom is taken away from him. So here we learn from this episode that uh, it is very important for us to be obedient to God's will for our life. And one of the God's will is that none shall be lost. So that it is important for us as his sons and his daughter is to go into every opportunity to share the love of Abba Father for us. Whether people believe or listen or, or accept it is not our concern, but it's the Spirit of God that will, through our testimony, will convict those and bring them into the kingdom. So here in John 6, 38, it says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, these are the words of Yeshua. And so he emphasized it is doing God's will and to be obedient to the Father unto death. So he went and he pleaded with the Father in the garden of Gethsemane. And he said, but not my will be done, but your will be done. And he then willingly went and took on the suffering, the stripes, and then finally nailed on the cross and he gave up his spirit for you and I. So here in Matthew 7, 21, he said, Not everyone who say to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So again, these are the warnings that Yeshua has given to us. So we must continually remember what is the will of the Father. It's very clearly written in his word that his will is that none shall perish, that all will come into the loving and saving grace of the shed blood of his Son that died for you and I. So it is important for us in every living breath that we have is that any opportunity that we have emboldened by the Spirit of God to share the goodness of God with those that God has brought into our midst. All right, so here, uh, moving quickly, uh, it is also based on our individual faith. Our faith is not something that can be based on inheritance. Your father and your forefather may have done great exploit for the Lord. But uh, Abba Father does not have grandchildren. <laughs> he only has sons and daughters. So every one of us go to him in our own accord, in our own way. Uh, therefore, we have to uh, embrace the grace that he has given to us and anchor on our faith based on the eternal hope of glory. So here, there must be certain things that we have to be so on firm foundation, just like a boat that has been tossed around by the wave. And yet, when it has the anchor that's sunk down and anchor on the rock, the boat is kept in one safe place. So here, revelation about the future is something that will affect our present behavior. That's why we always emphasize to know the future is to be pre-warned and to be prepared. And the only person that can reveal to us what is to come is the Spirit of God. So here, it is not to satisfy our mental curiosity by the revelation, but the revelation of Yeshua, particularly in the book of Revelation, is to drive us to holiness, to be prepared, to be the radiant and pure and holy bread of Yeshua. So knowing the future 
It will affect our present behavior, but it is also not to just stir our own mental curiosity, but to drive us to holiness. Uh, knowing the future is not just for information, but it is for the incentive of knowing that the rewards will be plenteous, that whatever we do in this time where we still have a living breath, there will be great reward waiting for us where we meet face to face with our Lord Yeshua. And then here, the present preparation must be anchored, as I mentioned earlier, on the eternal hope, the hope of glory. So we need the Holy Spirit to reveal to us. And also we need to have this anchor of eternal hope. Uh, quoting from Romans 8, verse 23 to 25, and let me read to you. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we are self grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. What is this hope? That we will be redeemed. All right, that we will be with him one day. But a hope that is not seen is not hope. For what does one still hope for what he sees? What you see is no more hope. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So the hope is not seen, but the hope is very ingrained in our spirit. That is the hope of glory. And this hope of glory can only be manifested when we meet up with the Lord. It comes to the conclusion. So here, our faith, which is individual, must be anchored on this hope of glory. That no matter what uh, tempest or whatever storm that may come into our life, we are still anchored on this hope that we will be lifted up into glorious time so that we will not make a poor exchange. Um, yeah. One thing I just want to add is um, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. Mm -hmm. At the twinkling of an eye, okay, our body will be changed. Amen. Faith in Christ will rise up first. We who are in Christ, who are still alive, will then follow. But it's, everything is in nanosecond. It's like one after <laughs> another. But when, when you are caught up, our physical body will change from a corruptible body to incorruptible body, just like Jesus. Jesus is the first fruit from the dead. So we will be, so Jesus came and showed us what does an uh, incorruptible body look like? <laughs> it walks to <through> war. <laughs> no need to war. It just appeared. Okay. It's, um, it's just like the disciples, uh, the apostles, they were in closed door. Then Jesus can just appear. You know, it's like the Star Wars, you know, beam me up, Scotty, then just, <laughs> just appear, you know, up. So I think uh, the, the movie industry, when they do the movie, they are so advanced. You know? They, they caught, caught the idea uh, faster than the, the, a lot of the believers. Okay, so we are now having a corruptible body. That is why when a person died, within a few days, you have to quickly bury them already or cremate them or else the body will, will deteriorate. That's why Lazarus also, Jesus purposely reached there on the fourth day because Martha said, Jesus asked her to roll away the stone. Martha said, by this time, his body would have smelled already. It's, it's, it's um, so hot. And then the body would have, uh, what do you call that? It corroded, uh, <laughs> not corroded, what's the word? Deteriorated, you know, and smell already. Amen. And Amen. That is why our glorious hope is that we will put on a new body. A glorious body. So you will be beautiful, handsome, <laughs> young, full of vigor and full of light. That's why in Daniel it talks about those who are wise. They will shine like stars. Mm. So it's a glorious hope. So don't Amen. ask Jesus to delay. Ask him to come back quickly. <laughs> so always say Maranatha. Yes, okay? yes, come not, quickly. Not, some people say, please don't come back. 
I'm not ready, but it's a, such a glorious place. Why do, don't you go? Amen. You know, that means you don't understand where you are going. It's so glorious. Yes, thank you for uh, painting this picture of the eternal hope of glory. And it's so important for us to cling on to this anchor. This anchor of our faith must be so on firm foundation that when tribulation and trial comes into our life, we will not give up. We Amen. will not have a bad exchange. Amen. Amen. And here, those uh, hope is uh, uh, those with hope is influenced by the word of God and guided by the Holy Spirit. What about those that are hopeless? <laughs> those who are without hope, they are influenced by the past and guided by the mind and the body. And oftentimes, you know, they make mistakes and they continue to repeat like what history repeats itself. That's why we have wars and then continually nations never learn. You have the League of Nations and then we have the United Nations and yet they still cannot stop the war. So here, those without hope is actually hopeless and uh, they are tormented by the past. But we who have the hope is guided by the word of God and by his spirit. So what is hope? Hope is an expectation and a desire for a particular thing and an event to happen. And so what is this particular or peculiar thing that's going to happen? It is this glorious picture that my wife had just painted to you, that we have this glorious uh, body, uh, you know, and we will forever and ever have our Lord Yeshua. Amen. Amen. And so moving very quickly, uh, Yeshua is your personal Savior and his Lord. And uh, he has to be personal to you. I mentioned earlier, Abba Father doesn't have grandchildren. It has to be a personal relationship with Yeshua where we accepted him and he is the Lord of all. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. All right. So here, uh, God has already given us his uh, creative power demonstrated in nature. As I walk in the, you know, the uh, park connector in Singapore, I enjoy to listen to the crickets, we enjoy the chipping of the birds, and then the glorious sunshine that comes through the wooded areas, and then smell the wonderful smell of, uh, you know, the trees and the leaves. And the creation of God is so greatly manifested that the leaves are shining with, uh, you know, it is just amazing of our creativity of our God. And therefore, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, that means those who do not believe, will be without excuse. On the day of his return, he will ask, and we will have no excuse for those who do not acknowledge him as the creative God, a God that created us in his image and in his likeness. So here is Roman 1.20. And there are also two more requirements uh, besides uh, you know, uh, having this uh, understanding of uh, how wonderful and creative God he is. He demonstrated his power in nature. But there are just also two other requirements that we cannot come to our Lord without faith. All right. So in um, uh, without faith, all right, uh, it is impossible to please him mentioned in the book of Hebrew, uh, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is what? <laughs> the glorious hope, right? He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So with faith, uh, that also comes with repentance. So without repentance, there is no restitution, all right, of our sin. So in this case, here, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he's near, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man is thought, let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, he will abundantly pardon. So here, we need to have these two other pillars. One is that of faith on one hand and the other one to come to him with a repentant heart. So here, uh, the way that we move we all, always go and take the easiest path, all right? The path of least resistance. That's what the world look at it. We always have to look and to strive to perfection in the eyes of God. And it is only through hard work and that his path to him is always a narrow, is a gate and difficult, is the way that leads to life. So Yeshua said, I'm the only way, all right? To the Father. No man comes to the Father except through me. So there's only one way. 
all right? The only one way is through the redeeming blood of Yeshua. All right, so here in Isaiah 30, verse 21, it says, your, hear shall, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or whenever you turn to the left. So here we must tune our sensitivity of our spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit says to you. This is the way to go. This is not the way to go. But walk to the left, turn to the right, and whatever he does, we follow. But the only way that we can hear the Holy Spirit clearly is through knowing him through the word and through practicing our listening ear. All right? So Ephesians 4, 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. So here, the example of Enoch, that keep on talking to God, and knowing him, and walk and walk and walk into eternity. <laughs> uh, that is the uh, imagery that I always want to see, that we are so close to him, right, that we were at the twinkling of an eye, we will be harvested and to be with our Lord forever and ever. Amen. So our relationship with God is uh, always a two-way relationship. Uh, you know, he actually give us the grace, but he also needs us to co-work with him. So not only a work, lest any one of us should boast, all right? Because it's not just work alone, because he gave us the workmanship that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there are actually two phases. One is that God has given us the way to him, but we ourselves need to walk the path. We need to co-work with him. There is not just only one way that he says you come and that's it. But he wants us to co-journey. He wants us to be working together with him. All right. So there is this excitement of journeying with the Lord. So Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you always have obeyed, not in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this is the word from Apostle Paul. He says that we need to work out our uh, salvation with fear and trembling, lest we trip and fall. For it is but God in his grace who work in both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So here again, there is two sides of it. All right, God is there to give us grace, but we also have to do our part. All right, so therefore, this relationship is not just one way. All right, uh, you know, but it is a two flowing, two ways that uh, we need to prepare ourselves. Thank to you, be in love with him. Okay. Just uh, one thing to add is uh, we have gone through the book of Revelation uh, a few sessions ago. And one thing that stands out in chapter two and three to the, uh, to the letters to the seven churches it is repeated seven times. He who have the years, let him hear what the Holy Spirit says to the church. The years is a spiritual years because it's our inner man, the spirit man, that needs to hear what the Holy Spirit says. So that when you hear and obey, it will be an easy task because Jesus promised that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Amen. But when you do it your own way and you think that you are helping God, but God never tells you to do that way, it will be burdensome. It, the, the yoke is heavy. The burden will become heavy. The yoke is hard. So the relationship with God and hearing in the Old Testament is you hear behind your ear left or right, turn here, turn left, turn right. But now we are in New Testament, the Holy Spirit come and indwell in us. Sometimes you just have the inner knowing on top of hearing with your spiritual gifts, you will have an inner hearing because daily you are fed with the manna from heaven the word of God. So you, you develop your, your inner man is developed, becomes a mature uh, 
mature adult, no more infant that you get tossed to and fro. Amen. Uh, we have to move quite quickly. We have a few more minutes. Uh, so here, nothing is to continuously seek him. Right? It's not, like I said, at the last minute. So it's got to be a daily process. Right? Because we do not know the hour nor the time is coming back. So we have to be alert. Right? Over here, uh, you know, it's mentioned in uh, uh, Matthew, they talk about two men will be left in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Uh, two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Now we have dealt with this uh, through the teaching of Prophet Robert. Uh, many of the people thought that the first one to be taken will be the rapture and the one that's left behind will go into tribulation. But when you really look into the Greek understanding, uh, the word paralambano is to take or to receive by showing strong personal initiative. So the word taken is based on your own personal initiative, all right? the sinful nature that we have. And um, then the left behind is the word uh, at 5D, uh, probably sent away, release or discharge. So with this understanding, uh, uh, based on what the teaching from Prophet Robert, we come to a better and clearer understanding that the first one that will be taken away is actually taken to the Battle of Armageddon. And at the same time, almost at instantaneous time, you know, uh, the one that is uh, been left behind will also be caught up and uh, will meet a Lord in the air. So this is just something that uh, reinforced what we have learned in the past uh, from uh, Prophet Robert. So here, be persistent and in seeking, all right? Here it says in Matthew 7, 7, we need to ask. We get not because we fail to ask for it. We are his son and we are his daughter. And our father is always willing to give whatever we ask in accordance to his will. So we must know his will. And when we ask according to his will, we will see immediate respond from him. So here, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. So here, just a very quick reminder that uh, our Father is waiting for us. All right, uh, angels is on assignment. <laughs> if you don't ask the angels to go and uh, to carry out your assignment, they are twiggling the thumb and they have been feeling bored. You know? So uh, angels are our ministering spirit. They are given to us. So we got to ask them, we got to command them so that they can do our assignment. And most of all, we ask, the Spirit of God. We ask Yeshua, we ask Abba Father, and uh, he will reveal to us what we ask for, according again uh, to his will. So here, the story about this uh, Song of Solomon is very important. It depicts uh, the Sul uh, Sulamite uh, women, and it is a portrayal of what the bride of Christ is to seek after his, her lover. All right, so here we have to uh, take uh, some uh, lesson from, you know, how this uh, lovely Shulamite woman is continually, you know, seeking after his lo her lover. And uh, that is something that we can glean from it and we can learn from this uh, wonderful uh, book called The Song of Solomon. All right, and then here, the personal holiness. All right, without holiness, we cannot see God, all right? So in Hebrew 12, 14, it says, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church. We are the body of Yeshua. We are the glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemished. So here it's very clear. All right. It's very clear that it's in Ephesians 5, 27, that uh, we as the body of Yeshua, we need to be holy. All right. So therefore, Hebrew 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one see God. All right, so here uh, we do our part, all right, too, because uh, whatever thing that the Lord has uh, given to us, he expects us to co-work with him. So it's very clear that in Revelation 19, 7, 8, let me unpack for you here. He said, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So this is our part. Uh, we've got to do our part. We make ourselves pure and holy to be ready. And then verse 8, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen. So here this is the grace part. All right? So where we make ourselves ready, we will also be clothed with the cloth of righteousness. So here I want to emphasize that 
to in order to be the bride of Christ, we cannot just expect the rope of righteousness be given to us. We have to be ready. We have to work with fear and trembling of our own, not only our salvation, but to make ourselves holy and pure. And then the rope of righteousness will be given to us. All right, so here, the verse from Ephesians 5, 25 to 26 is that husband, love your wife, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might, what? Sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So here it's very clear that we will uh, renew our mind by the uh, washing of the of our, our mind with the word of God. So here the last, but not the only the one, is talk about the communal fellowship, that we are not an island by ourselves. So it's very important that many of us think that uh, it is good just to zoom in and zoom out, uh, go to various churches, various sermons and listen to it in the comfort of a home. But that is not enough. The things that God has told us is to gather together with a communal uh, relationship, fellowship with fellow believers and iron sharpens iron. So here in Hebrew 10, 25, he says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much that the more as you see the day approaching. Now we are seeing the day approaching. So this Hebrew 10, 25, uh, let me unpack for you. It says very clearly that exhorting one another, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. So, you know, I would encourage all of you, now that the restriction of COVID uh, has been uh, removed, we can now, even non-vaccinated, we can still gather and worship God. So I want to encourage you to return back to your church and to worship Him and to fellowship with fellow believers. Now, the word exalting here comes from the same Greek word, uh, paraketos, which is actually a helper. So here what uh, Hebrew 10.25 says that we need to exhort one another means we need to uh, parakeet, to be a helper to one another. Encourage. And how can you be a helper and an encouraging to one another without being together? <laughs> you can't. Even a phone call may not be as effective even though it is much needed, uh, but it will not be as effective as a physical assembly of mutually supporting, loving worshipping God together. So again, I want to encourage you listening to uh, this Shabbat service to now return back to your church and uh, to join your fellow brothers and sisters in communal worship right, and bring the glory of God into your respective churches. So the day of approaching is near. We need to encourage and to support one another. All right, in Daniel 7.25, and this will be the last, uh, he says, he will speak out against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one and that he will intend to make alteration in times and in law and that will be given into his hand for the time, times and half a time. So here we are talking about during the great tribulation where Antichrist will be revealed and he will wear down the saints. He will wear down by saints in terms of uh, you know, constantly attacking you. All right. And this end time will be characterized by the unusual pressure that we have never seen before. A very simple, uh, a very recent uh, uh, analogy of this is the various uh, imposition on us to restrict our movement, okay. you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the COVID restrictions that we, uh, without a mask, we cannot go into the various places. Now, this is just small time uh, restriction. The one that is coming is going to be many, many more time uh, 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 restrictive uh, and you will come and it says down here uh, the antichrist will wear us down so we need to be prepared all right we need to be prepared by uh, you know arming ourselves with the armor of god as mentioned in Ephesians 6 and therefore i will proclaim and i will declare that all of us having heard the various uh, quotations from the word of god that we will embrace it and we will commit it into our spirit that we will be strong and we will proclaim that we would like and we will work towards to be sanctified by the word of God and to be holy and to be ready to be the bride of Christ. Yeah, actually in the word of God, it, they warn us in the last day, persecution will come. 
So we have to really build our inner man to, to be able to withstand the onslaught Amen. of the of the hopes of um, satanic forces. Because Jesus himself warned us that the believers will be persecuted. So, and because Jesus loved us, so he do not want us to be caught by surprise. So, we'll just be ready. All right, here, um, I think um, that we will end our sharing. But uh, before that, I have an uh, announcement again. The last thing is that we ask ourselves, are you ready? Uh, you know, get ready and work while there is still day. For the night cometh, no one of us can work. So if you enjoy this video, do subscribe by pressing this button below. You'll be the first to be informed of any posting that I make. Shalom. Goodbye.